Hey, I'm Kyle. Seriously, have you ever thought about writing a book? Well, I've got something for you. I just wrote a book. My 18th book is on how to write a book. You need to get a copy of this book. It's very simple. It's practical. It shows you how to. It takes the mystery away from it. This will be a great blessing to you. Click the link on your screen and get a copy today of how to write a book. It will bless you. We are all on a journey, a path to somewhere, and stories of that journey make us who we are. See, everyone has a story to tell, but not everyone knows how. How to Write a Book by Dr. Kyle Searcy teaches you how to leave a legacy that will last forever. Visit the website below to buy your copy today. Hello, my friends, I'm Kyle Searcy. And you know, I have a passion that people grow in leadership. Leadership is amazing. And the better leader you become, the more your life will change in every area. And I wrote a book to help you out on that. It's a book called Counter Intuitive Leadership. There's an aspect of leadership that's not intuitive, it's counterintuitive, but it's powerful. It's life transforming. Why don't you click the link on your screen, get a copy today of Counter Intuitive Leadership. You, my friend, will be happy you did.
happen to a person is not to die. That is not the worst thing that could happen. The worst thing that could happen is to die without Jesus. Looking, looking down at yourself. Looking down. I can see almost the whole city, but I can also see my dad at the same time. Wow. It was something unbelievable. And then when it got to that point, I went straight to hell. You went straight to hell. How do you know it was hell? It's, it's glowing, molting rocks all around you. It's like people are standing on shells of rock. It's very hot, it's glowing. You're very thirsty. You can't breathe. You're extremely hungry. There's extreme torment. Mm. I mean, the odor is terrible. I mean, everything about hell you can imagine is everything bad you can imagine life is what hell is. And the word says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. That I spoke life to him and told Satan you cannot have it. And I bind your work in the name of Jesus, that he shall live and fulfill the prophetic words that were spoken over his life. Don't stop prophesying over your kids. Don't stop, don't stop. The devil cannot have them. I don't care if they go all the way to hell. Don't you leave them there. Get them back out of there. Get them to where God wants them to be. There's destiny in your mouth. There's destiny in your life. And here's a sign and a wonder that shows us that. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. Glory to God. Josh, they're, they're young people that are going to see this video. They're older people that are going to see this video. They're people that have days left to live. There are people that have hours left to live that might see this. There are people that are 20 that feel like the rest of their life is assured. I want you to just look into that camera. I want you to just talk to them from your heart. What do you have to say to them? What's your last message to them before we close this out? Hey, I'm Kyle Searcy. Have you ever thought about writing a book? Well, I've got something for you. I just wrote a book. My 18th book is on how to write a book. You need to get a copy of this book. It's very simple. It's practical. It shows you how to. It takes the mystery away from it. This will be a great blessing to you. Click the link on your screen and get a copy today of how to write a book. It will bless you. We are all on a journey, a path to somewhere. 
and stories of that journey make us who we are. See, everyone has a story to tell, but not everyone knows how. How to Write a Book by Dr. Kyle Searcy teaches you how to leave a legacy that will last forever. Visit the website below to buy your copy today. Hello, my friends, I'm Kyle Searcy. And you know, I have a passion that people grow in leadership. Leadership is amazing. And the better leader you become, the more your life will change in every area. And I wrote a book to help you out on that. It's a book called Counter Intuitive Leadership. There's an aspect of leadership that's not intuitive, it's counterintuitive, but it's powerful. It's life transforming. Why don't you click the link on your screen, get a copy today of Counter Intuitive Leadership. You, my friend, will be happy you did. The number one question people ask God or said they would ask God if they had a chance to meet with him is what am I here for? It's the number one question around the world, different geographic boundaries. People said if I got a chance to ask God one question, the question they ask would be what am I here for? What's my purpose? We're going to unfold that in this series. Bishop Fred started the series off last Sunday. Uh, I'm in part two of the series. We're grateful for his message. It was absolutely powerful. Thank you, Bishop, for filling in while I was on assignment outside but today we're going to begin to talk about the beginning of purpose say the beginning of purpose with me now I want you to ask the Lord again say Lord speak to me in this message point number one in the message says that purpose must begin with the purposer if you want to understand what something is designed to do you have to go back to the manufacturer if you want to know what something is supposed to be you have to go back to the person that made it it's the very person who created something that knows what it stands for. And I had this thought this morning. It's kind of a strange thought because I don't really watch these kind of movies. But do you ever watch alien movies? Anybody ever watch alien movies? Doesn't matter which one. Anybody ever watch? Okay. First service had a lot of folks watch alien movies. This service is a little bit more anointed than the last service, I guess. <laughs> but here's what happens to the alien movies. They, 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 you know, they, they cause you to know who the main characters are. It's going to be a guy or a girl or a family or whatever. They establish that in the beginning. Then eventually at some point, they're going to be sitting out under the tree or driving their car, and they're going to see a strange sight, some UFO, some identified flying object. And then usually some creature will in some way attempt to make contact with them or attempt to find out who they are. There's this attempt at communication. But whenever that happens, what they're always trying to do is establish communication with who sent this thing because they're trying to find out, what do you want? Are you here to steal our natural resources? Are you here to take over the planet? What are you here for? And they never know what this unidentified flying object or this unidentified thing is until they get in touch with the one who sent it. You know, that's the way it is with you and I. We don't really know why we're here and we never will know why we're here unless we connect it back to the one who sent us. We're sent to this earth. We're not accidental. We have to understand that if we're going to talk about purpose, it starts with the purposer. So here are a couple of things I want to share with you. Number one, God originated everything. How many things did God originate? How many things came out of God? How many things did God start? Everything. Colossians chapter 1 verse 16. Read it with me. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. Visible and invisible. So God made the visible and the invisible. Look, look at the next part. All things were created through him 
and for him. Number two, everything is by him and for him. We'll see that again. Romans 11, 36. For of him and through him and to him are what? All things. So we know that all things are from him or of him and through him, but all things are also to him. Everything exists for him. So everything is created by him and everything exists for his purpose. Now, number three tells us this, that his purposes will ultimately prevail. Isaiah 14 tells us that when God decides to do something, it will come to pass. But I want you to understand that God's general purposes will prevail, but your individual purpose will be fulfilled only if you align with his purpose. Oh, let me say that to you again. Let me read it to you, actually, in Isaiah 14. I want you to follow with me. The Lord of hosts has what? Sworn, saying, surely, as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. For the Lord of hosts has purpose, and who will annul it? I love that, man. I love that right there. You know what God's saying? He said, I'm going to do something. Who's going to undo it? I'm going to decide something. Who's going to decide against it? What I say is going to go. When I call the shots, who's going to unshoot what I shoot? Shoot, man. That's, that's, I, love the, I love the wording of it. But understand this, that the general purposes of God, say general, general. those will come to pass. The book of Revelation is going to happen. When history is to end, it's going to happen. When the earth is to be burned up and God's going to do new heaven and new earth, that's going to happen. That's general purpose, but individual purpose, your purpose in mind will only be fulfilled as we align our hearts with God. You have to understand that. But here's what I love about God. God is the only being so bad and so amazing and so austere and so tremendous that he can give you free will and cause history to end up exactly where he wants it. He can say, you can choose. And knows at the end of the day every choice you're going to make and how it's going to end up. He, he, he gave us the end of the book in the book of Revelation, yet he gives you free will. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Just say he's amazing. Number four, understand that all purposes are eternal. Every purpose we have is not just temporal, it's eternal. Our purposes will last all the way into the eons of time. Number five, the Bible says we're predestined on purpose. Very important verse, Ephesians 1.11. Let's read it together. Ready? Read. In him also... We have obtained an inheritance. Stop right there. How many of you are happy you have an inheritance? Yes. Now, you usually get an inheritance when somebody dies. You know the story. You heard that uncle died or your aunt died or your cousin died. And after you hear that they died, you cry a little bit. And then you uh, go to the safe. <laughs> Maybe you wait till the funeral is over and bury them, put them in the ground and go back to the church and eat chicken, macaroni and cheese and collard greens. That's what they always have. And then you go to the safe. But what happens when somebody dies is we want to find out what they left. That's biblical. The Bible said a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So when somebody dies, you miss them, you cry, but you want to know what did you leave me? You would hope that Papa wasn't ro a rolling stone and wherever he laid his hat was his home. You would hope that when he died, he left you more than alone. A-L-O-A-N, not A-L-O-N-E. <laughs> I think I'm talking too fast. You'll get all of that next week. But you want to make sure something was left because when they left something, that means you have an inheritance. And here's what the Bible is saying. You have obtained an inheritance. There's something Jesus left for you when you died. And God, who is so wise, predestined you according to that inheritance. Ah, that's deep stuff. Wish I had time to unpack it. The Bible says when he, when he led captivity captive, when he was raised up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. What God gave us is according to our purpose. So when we talk the week after Father's Day, I'm going to cause you to understand how to align your gifts and your heart and all of that with your purpose. Today, I have to draw you back into the purposer, the creator. I have to cause you to understand that you will never understand your purpose just trying to understand you. There are people that often go on journeys. I heard about a guy who left his job and just went to walk across the United States to kind of find his purpose. I don't know if he left from New Jersey going to California or California going to New Jersey. I can guarantee whichever one he got to, if he didn't connect with God somewhere in there, he didn't find his purpose. Because purpose always starts with the purposer. That's why Romans 8.28, one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible, I want you to quote it with me. Ready? I guess you're not ready. Put on the screen, Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, 
and those who are called according to... Isn't that good verse? Let's thank God for that verse. That's an amazing verse. And we know that... Put it back up. And we know that all things work together for good for everybody. Isn't that what it says? Doesn't say everybody? Doesn't say everybody? Doesn't say everybody? Oh, so all things don't work together for good for everybody? Who do they work together for good for? Those that love God and those that are according to his... So if you're not in purpose, everything's not working together for good for you. In other words, if you're not aligned with God, things are not working together for good. So I have to start this message with realigning your heart and reconnecting you with the creator. Because, man, when we're wasting life, it's not that God can't take the messes we made and cause them to work back together for our good. But while you're away from purpose, there's no biblical guarantee that everything is working together for good. That's why I hear people tell stories sometimes where the Lord called me and I ran from him for 30 years. And I ended up in a hospital bed with my leg in a cast. And they're telling the story like it's glamorous. And I finally said, Lord, I'll preach. Man, you wasted 30 years, dude. God could redeem and restore, but you wasted 30 years. Why run from God? How many of you know it's futile to run from your purpose and the one who created you? It's better to submit to purpose. It's better to do what God called you to do. It's not glamorous to run from him. And I run into preacher after preacher just glamorizing that thing. Lord, yeah, the Lord this and Lord that. And I finally said, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. That's the craziest thing I ever heard. The minute God calls you, say, here am I, Lord, I'll do it. Be like Isaiah, here am I, Lord, send me. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. So we're predestined on purpose. Now, point number two on your notes. It's probably one of the most important points you'll get in this whole purpose series. I want you to hear it. I want you to get it. I want you to allow it to sink deep in your heart. Purpose is about being before doing. You want to understand number one in your purpose? It's about being before doing. Do you know what you are? You're not a human doing. You're a human being. And who we be, be more important than what we do. What do I mean? Number one, we're called to be with Jesus. Mark chapter 3, verse 14, and he appointed 12 that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach. Why did the Bible have it like that? He appointed 12, okay, we get that, that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach. We're called to be with God. We're called to be with Jesus. Number two, we're called to be like Jesus. We're called to be what? What did I just say? Would you read Romans 8, 29 with me? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be what? Conformed to the image of his son. So people don't, God, what's my purpose? God, what's my purpose? Oh, what's my purpose? Well, here's purpose number one, to be like Jesus. To be conformed to the image of his son. You know, that's the way we do in families. When, when a kid is two, year old, two years old or three years old or four years old or five years old, you don't know what they're going to be. You don't know if they're going to be a doctor. You don't know if they're going to be a nurse. You don't know if they're going to be a construction worker. But what you start teaching them is what it means to be in your family. You start teaching them the ways of your family. How to act. How to dress. I'll never forget growing up in my family, there were some very strict rules my dad had. He died when I was 11. Very, very strict rules. One of the rules is no smacking at the table. Ooh, you can't eat like some of the folks around here, I know. Some of you, when I want music, I go to lunch with you. You don't even know it, but I take you out to lunch when I want music. I'm not playing the music on my phone. I'm listening to you eat with music. I won't tell you who it is. I'll just keep enjoying it. <laughs> Couldn't do that at my house. Oh, you start smacking, you got, you're in trouble. We have to sit properly. We had to pass things. What was my dad saying? He said, this is what it means to be a part of our family. We had to speak properly. I remember when my sister did something. I can't remember if she spoke improperly or she smacked, but she, she did something at the table that was out, out of line. And my dad, it's like, y'all see the Incredibles? What's the one that can stretch? 
it's like his hand stretched across the table and he backslapped my sister. I remember she fell out the chair like it was done. There was a very strict rule in my family. You speak right, you act right, you do things properly. I remember when he would always brag to his friends when she was, my sister was like eight years old and she, she said some comment at the table that was, that was real intellectual and real high pollutant. So what was my dad doing saying, this is how I want you to act. If you're seriously, you speak this way. If you're seriously, you act that way. So here's what God does to us. He says, here's your purpose. Number one, be like my son. Before you figure out what you're going to do, purpose number one, act like Jesus. Love like he loves. Forgive like he forgives. Treat people like he treats them. Live like he does. He lived totally submitted to the Father, so you live totally submitted to the Father. Do everything he did. In fact, your model should be WWJD. What would Jesus do? You go to work, somebody gets on your nerve, what would Jesus do? Somebody cut you off in traffic, what would Jesus do? Somebody's bothering you, what would Jesus do? Somebody broke up with you and they dogged you out, what would Jesus do? Would Jesus do, I don't know who this is, but somebody's thinking about really, really destroying somebody's life who broke up with you. Do not do that, baby girl. Don't do that. How could Jesus look at people on the cross and say, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. And so just as sure as I'm standing right here, somebody's planning on getting even and destroying the life of somebody because they occupied your time, they told you all those lies. Let the Lord deal with that boy and you go ahead and serve God and do what God's called you to do. You know who you are. It's Jesus. You read other books, but read the New Testament. Talk to other people, but talk to him. Whenever you begin to understand or try to discern how to treat your wife or how to treat your husband or how to act, understand that your purpose is to act like Jesus. Number three, your purpose is to be connected with Jesus. But number four, oh, number four, oh, number four is my favorite one. Our purpose is devotion to Jesus. What is it? What is devotion? Talk to me. What is devotion? It's that and more. Let's read 2 Corinthians 11 verse 1. I want you to read it with me. Ready? Let's read. I hope you will put up. Go ahead. Please bear with me. Go ahead. Uh-huh. I promise you. Uh-oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I promise you as a what? Pure by to what? I promised you, Paul's writing, he said, I promised you, I presented you, I promised you as a pure bride to one husband Christ. Why is he using that kind of language? Interesting. Verse 3, read it with me. But I fear that somehow your pure, undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. It's interesting language he uses. Paul said, my mission in life is to cause you to be the bride of Christ, to promise you or cause you to be engaged to Christ so he can be a pure husband and you could be a bride. He uses bridal language. He uses love language. Why? Because when it comes to purpose, our purpose is to be devoted to a person. Paul said, but I'm afraid lest as the serpent tricked Eve, your hearts, your mind should be corrupted. Listen to the way he says it. But I fear that somehow your pure, undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted. You know what God wants us to have? You know what our purpose is? To have pure, undivided devotion to a person. Listen to me, church. It's not the kind of preaching that's going to make you want to swing off the chandeliers, but it'll change your life. You should understand our real purpose. Our purpose is to be totally, unwaveringly, unswervingly committed to a person. Let me break it down to you another way. Our purpose is to be in love with God. I love God. You don't love God? I love God. What's wrong with you? Ask your neighbor that say, I love God. You don't love God? I love God. What's wrong with you? Want to know what our purpose is? To love him with all of the heart, all of the soul, all of the mind, all of the strength. 
What God measures in our purpose is how devoted we are to God. Now we live in the South with a bunch of religious people where we check off our church box and we go to church and we know all the phrases to say. We know exactly what we say in church. If I start and I say, won't he, what are you going to say? Do it. Do it. <laughs> I, and I could do about 20 more phrases like that. I was in a place the other day and a preacher would say a phrase and stop. They complete the phrase. I mean, we just know, we know these phrases. We know how to say it. We know how to do it. But Jesus said, these people draw near to me with their mouth. Honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. He said, in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. What God wants more than anything is pure devotion to a person. He wants us to love Jesus with everything we have. Do you remember what he wrote to the church in Revelation chapter 2? And he said, I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience. I know how you've endured. I know how you're living holy. I know how you've overcome, but I have something against you. Well, what is it, Lord? He said, you left your first love. He said, repent and go back and do the first works again. But the thing that amazes me about that story is he said, if you don't repent, I'll put your candlestick out. That's serious. Because here's what he's saying to them. Either I'm going to shut you down, not allowing my presence and my spirit to be among you, or at least I'll remove your influence. God, but they were laboring. They were patient. They endured. They lived holy. God said, I know, but their heart's far from me. Because their heart's far from me, I can't stand it. It, it. it reminds me of the scripture that says, where Jesus said, I wish you were cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. I wish you were cold or hot. God, you can't be serious. You wish I was cold? Yep. I wish you were cold or hot. But you're lukewarm. And lukewarm is a mixture of cold and hot. So you got just enough Jesus to think you're okay, though you're not okay. That's what he's saying to them. You've you got just enough religion to think you got it going on, but you don't have it going on. You're like the people that will say to me one day, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name and cast out devils in your name and done many wonderful works? And he'll say, I never knew you. The word knew there is the word gnosko, which means intimate. I was never intimate with you. We never had relationship. And the danger of where we live in the Bible Belt is that we're so comfortable with religion there are people you work with, there are people in your neighborhood, and maybe there are people in here that are so comfortable with God that you don't realize that you don't even know God. Amen. And worse, God might not even know you. Number one purpose is devotion, is intimacy, is to love him, is to passionately pursue him, is to let our heart beat for him. It's to be crazy about him. It's to be like Mary instead of Martha. You remember the story about Mary and Martha when Jesus went to their house? Mary and Martha, there's some sweet ladies. You ought to meet them. Mary and Martha were amazing. It was about lunchtime, and Jesus went to the house with him. Martha went into the kitchen to cook because everybody had to eat. Mary sat and listened to the words of Jesus. I could just imagine Martha in the kitchen getting frustrated because she was doing it all by herself. They used to cook together, but now Mary's sitting there listening to Jesus. And finally, Martha walked out, and I'm glad she addressed Jesus instead of addressing Mary. We ought to do just like her. When you're mad at somebody, talk to God about them. Don't talk to them. Amen. Can you imagine the fuss and the fight if she walked out there and started addressing Mary? Mary, get your tail in here and help me out. It could have been on, but she started talking to Jesus. She said, Jesus, would you bid my sister to come and help me in the kitchen? And Jesus looked at Martha and said, Martha, you're careful and troubled about many things, but only one thing is needful. One thing. One thing. Mary has chosen that good part, and I'm not going to take it away from her. Now, because I like being funny sometimes, I would have said, well, Jesus, you feel like fasting today? Because <laughs> I'm trying to cook you some food. What he was saying is, you're stressed, you're anxious, you're worried, but you're not prioritizing relationships. The reason you're stressed is you're so stressed over what you're supposed to do, but he's saying, I'm more interested in who you are than what you do. Let me put it another way. Let what you do come out of who you are instead of letting the cart be before the horse. And I'm telling you today, and I felt this so strongly earlier, there is a passion, there is a fire that God wants to begin to rekindle in our hearts because if you want to understand purpose, your purpose is to be a lover. Your purpose is to be a bride. 
Your purpose is to be crazy about Jesus. Your purpose is to love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Your purpose is to wake up in the morning with a smile on your face and a song in your heart because you're not just serving him, you're loving him, you're honoring him. You, you, you know, there's a song that says, may I never lose, may we never lose our wonder. May we never lose our wonder. Wide-eyed and mystified. May we be just like a child staring at the beauty of our king. Man, my fear is that it's so easy to become professional Christians. Where we just do the stuff we're supposed to do and we tithe and we go to church, but our hearts are far from him. You know what your purpose is? To love him. And I guarantee if you've been saved for a minute, you may still be on fire, you may still be in love with him, but I hear God saying, no, no, there's some folks here that don't love me like they used to. There's some people in this building right now that are not moved by me like they used to be. I never want to get to the point, I'm not moved by God. I don't want to think about what he does, does for me and not have tears in my eyes. I don't want to ever be at a place I can't sing and dance and clap and praise him and let my heart be moved and cry and weep. I told the earlier service, and if you heard this, don't, don't, don't answer it, but I told the earlier service about one of my favorite songs called Reckless Love. Reckless. I think it's called Reckless Love. You ever heard that song? It talks about the overwhelming right? Never ending, what? Reckless, what? Love of God. Oh, he chases me down, fights till I'm found, does what? Leaves a 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Yet he gives himself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. That song blows me away every time I listen to it. And the guy who sang it is an amazing singer, but that's not what blows me away about it. The lyrics blow me away. But I'm going to share that song with you again. And I want you to pick out my favorite word in that song. Here's how the first verse goes. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. How he chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. That's amazing. What do you think my favorite word is in that verse? Holler it out at me. Reckless, love, overwhelming. Let me say it again. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, matchless love of God. How he chases me down, fights till I'm found, leads to 99. What's my favorite word? Yell it at me. Never-ending, reckless. No. Come on, keep yelling. No. 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 No, I thought y'all knew me better than that. What's my favorite word? Come on, help me out. Tell me one more time. Let me tell you what my favorite word is. My favorite word is the word, oh. 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 He doesn't just sing the never ending. He goes, oh, the overwhelming never ending. That oh is what I want in my spirit. There's a difference in an oh and an oh. Oh, I, oh, I got to go. Oh, I got to pray. Oh, I got to read. No. Oh, God, I never want to lose an O in my heart. What God wants to do today is put that O back in our spirit because you are called, listen to me, to be a lover of Jesus. You are called to be the bride of Christ. You are called to be overwhelmingly in love with him. And all purpose starts right there. I cannot show you purpose about how to use your gift unless you understand that gift is connected to the giver of the gift. I cannot show you purpose as to how God made you and wired you until I show you that you could use every gift he's given you and change the world. But if that purpose is not connected back into his heart, something's missing, something's broken. Now, there are multiple ways that you can stay connected here at Fresh Anointing House of Worship in new and exciting ways. We have a brand new website and app that just launched. Don't forget to check out fayhow.org and download the Fayhow app. All you have to do is search F-A-H-O-W in your Apple Store or Google Play. It is the perfect way to stay connected and up to date on all things going on at Fresh. You can live stream our services, watch previous sermons, and you'll have access to sermon notes and more. There are multiple ways to give here at Fresh and Winning House of Worship. One of those ways is online on our new website, fayhow.org. Just click the Give tab at the top of the homepage. Once there, you will put in your information and verify your phone number. Then you can proceed with your giving. Another way you can give is by texting Fresh Anointing to 77977. You will receive a link that will take you to our Push Pay platform where you can give. 
We want to encourage you to share this live stream with your friends and family. Also, tell us in the comment section where you're watching from and how this message is impacting you.